Okay. Oh, did you need me to? That's okay, so I'm going to welcome everybody. So hello everybody who's joined us this afternoon uh, for, the, for the webinar on proportional representation and good governance. So the first thing that I want to check is that everybody can see and hear me. So I have a little question box. Um, okay, so I have a little question box and I want people to say yes if they can see me and yes if they can see my slide and yes if they can hear me so I see yeah okay goody thank you Jen for saying yes 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 what would I do uh, without Jen who stops me from spending half hour talking to myself okay all right so we're gonna get started we have a special guest today that's Salman Orellana and he has written a really neat book that just came out about a year ago called Electoral Systems and Governance How Diversity Can Improve uh, Decision Making so the first thing we're gonna do on this webinar is I'm going to go through the PR 101 presentation some of you have seen this before so if you have just uh, tune back in in about 20 minutes and then Salman's gonna come on and he's going to talk about his research and then we'll have a chance afterward to uh, ask questions which both he and I can answer. So while you're listening to me and watching the presentation and his presentation, you can be thinking of questions and typing them in the question box. And when we get to the end of the presentations, I'm going to open up the question box and we'll cover as many questions as we can. So Salman, I'll just ask you to turn off your webcam for the next 20 minutes or so. Perfect. Okay. I'm just moving my own webcam over so that I'm not blocking my own screen. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to cover is what is Fair Vote Canada and why do we need PR, uh, some of the problems of winner take all voting systems, some of the research behind PR, and we've added on something about where we are now in the process and what you can do to help. So first of all, Fair Vote Canada is a national multipartisan grassroots citizens group for proportional representation. So we support PR at every level of government. So basically we believe that whether you're voting federally, provincially, municipally, you should be able to elect a representative who reflects your values and the results should be proportional to the popular vote. We have over 64,000 signers now on our Declaration of Voters' Rights and one of the biggest things you can do to help us is just to share that declaration with your friends. So one thing that's important to understand is that PR is not uh, one voting system. So often when people hear the word proportional representation, um, something comes to mind about a voting system that they've heard of. It might be something to do with Italy and Israel, thanks to our media. Um, it might be whatever system your province happened to have a referendum on, and you may remember some detail about that and think that's proportional representation. Actually, PR is just a principle that says if a party gets 30% of the vote, they should get 30% of the seats. And from a voter-centered perspective, that your vote should count towards electing representation of your choice. So we'll start with a few of the problems with winner-take-all voting systems. And these are problems that apply to all voting systems in the winner-take-all family. So for example, if you look at our 1993 federal election results, you can see that the Bloc Québécois, um, and for our speaker, Bloc is our party, and the progressive conservatives who are national got almost the same percent of the popular vote. However, one of those parties then became our official opposition party, while the other party only got two seats and lost their official party status. And in 1997, um, our official opposition party, the Reform Party, which is based in Western Ontario, Western, Western Canada, sorry, actually be, they became our official opposition but they had no seats east of Manitoba so 
it wasn't very representative of, um, of the Canadians that didn't vote for the governing party. And if we look at our 2008 federal election results, we can see again that the Bloc Québécois and the Green Party got almost the same number of votes from Canadians. But unfortunately, the Bloc was able to pick up a very large number of seats, 49 seats, while the Green Party voters got zero representation. And that's because uh, all the support for the Bloc was concentrated in one area of the country, whereas the Greens are a national party whose support is spread out across Canada, but not usually high enough to win a plurality in any one riding. So I haven't put the percentages on this pie chart because I just kind of added this in at the last minute, but it's kind of interesting to see in 2008 how the House of Commons might have looked different. Um, here's what we got on the left with first past the post, and here's what the results would have been uh, under a proportional system if everybody had voted the same way, which of course we know is not going to happen under a proportional system. But it gives you a rough idea of how, as our guest speaker is going to talk about later, how PR increases diversity. So jumping ahead a little bit to our federal election of 2011, you can see that in the, in the province of Saskatchewan, about half of the voters voted conservative. But that got the Conservative Party 92% of the seats, or 13 out of 14 seats in Saskatchewan. And in Alberta, it was almost the same thing. About two-thirds of voters in Alberta chose the Conservative Party, but that got them 26 out of the 27 seats. So there really wasn't much representation for voters of other parties. And heading over to the other side of the political spectrum, in 2011, um, as we all know, the NDP, our uh, Social Democratic Party, made a huge breakthrough becoming Canada's official opposition party. And the media was full of things like, you know, Orange Crush, uh, the NDP is, you know, sweeping Quebec. But actually, just like the Conservatives in Alberta, the NDP only won 43% of the popular vote in Quebec, but that gave them almost all of the seats. So one thing that happens in winner-take-all systems is that a very small shift in the popular vote can lead to a very large shift in terms of who holds the power. So if we look at what happened with the federal conservatives over a period of three elections, their percentage of the popular vote increased about 1% to 2% each election. Um, capping off at 39%. But that small shift in votes, because it was concentrated in a few swing ridings, gave, uh, resulted in us going from minority governments to a single party having 100% of the power. And because our voting system works like that, it basically means that voters in about half of the ridings in Canada really don't matter to the political parties. So this is an advertisement from a polling company called Stratcom and it says political parties aren't focused on every voter in every riding, only those that matter the most and you should be too. So basically what it's saying is if you live in a safe riding where the uh, MP, the party that's that holds your riding could run a lamppost and the lamppost would win. The parties aren't particularly interested in coming to your riding and making announcements and kissing babies because it's pretty much a foregone conclusion who's going to win the riding. Now we know there's always surprises, but to a large degree, um, many voters live in safe seats. And the elections tend to get focused on a few voters in a few swing ridings where all the money and energy goes. So if we look at our 2011 election results, here you can see uh, the results with first past the post on the left and the results if we had the seats reflected proportionally on the right. So the most obvious thing you can see is that with a proportional system, as people voted in 2011, no single party would have crossed the majority power line. So what that would have meant is that uh, either we would have had a minority government or two or more parties would have had to cooperate to form a majority coalition. And of course, the important caveat is that with proportional systems, people do vote differently when they know that their vote's going to count 
um, often more than will come out to vote and they'll vote more sincerely. So another problem we talk about quite a lot is voters which, uh, which ele who elected no one. So we used to call these wasted votes. You can also call them disregarded votes. I think that votes which elected no one is pretty clear. Basically, they're voters who cast ballots for, uh, for candidates who did not get elected. And so basically, their ballot had absolutely no impact on the outcome of the election. And it's sort of a bit of a myth that this problem mainly applies to voters for small parties like the Greens. Actually, it's voters for the large parties uh, like the Liberals and the Conservatives who cast the most wasted votes each election. And that's about half of the voters in Canada who cast ballots that have absolutely no effect. And so we can see in the last federal election where uh, the voter turnout went up, which was fabulous, um, that also resulted in more people casting ballots that didn't elect anybody. So we got another 39% majority government and this time 9 million voters or 52% of voters cast ballots that didn't elect any representation. So this may seem the norm um, when you've grown up with a winner-take-all voting system that, you know, oh, there's winners and there's losers, you didn't win, too bad, try again next time. But actually most modern democracies don't function on this principle. They function on the idea that almost all voters should be able to elect representation of their choice and the legislature should reflect how people voted. So you can see here in this chart um, the approximate percentage of disregarded votes in different countries and the three on the left use proportional systems. This is an advertisement from a bus stop in New Zealand. It's about two years old. It's from their last federal election. And here they were encouraging people to come out and vote. And the tagline that they were using to do that was, your vote is worth exactly the same as mine. And that's a powerful thing. And that really boils down in a nutshell uh, what Fair Vote Canada is wanting. We want a system where almost every voter can cast an effective vote and voters are equal. Right now voters are not equal because, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a conservative and I live in one of the ridings in Alberta and I cast a ballot, then my ballot helps elect somebody. But if I move over here to where I live, to Kitchener-Waterloo, and I cast a ballot for a conservative, well, now my ballot didn't do anything. So that's what we want to change. So if we skip forward to our October election, um, you can see that these were the results in Toronto, how Toronto voted on the left, and we all know there was a very large wave of strategic voting for the Liberals in the last election, and this is what Toronto got. And again, how Atlantic Canada voted, and what Atlantic Canada got. And how Alberta voted, and what Alberta got. And Alberta is actually more representative now than it has been before. And here's our overall results for the 2015 federal election. Um, and you can see on the left how people voted and on the right what the results in Parliament were. So I just like the Conservatives got a majority with 39.6% of the popular vote. Now the Liberal Party has a majority with 39.5% of the popular vote. And there was actually not much of a shift in support for the Conservatives. They only got, they got almost the same number of votes as they did in 2011. It's just that those votes were distri distributed differently. So what's going to happen in 2019 if we don't have electoral reform is really anybody's guess. So another problem that we sometimes talk about are phony majority governments. And what we mean by that are majority governments that are formed with the support of less than half of the voters. And that's actually what our system most often produces. And you can see that since World War I, um, this needs to be updated, but we've actually had 17 majority governments. And the number who were supported by 50% or more of Canadians is four. And the last one was in 1984. Sometimes our voting system um, delivers something a little more disturbing than that, and this is what we might call a wrong winner election. 
So you can see in British Columbia, uh, what happened was that the NDP got 39% of the popular vote and the Liberals got 42% of the popular vote and the NDP formed a majority government. So it's when things like this happen that often spurs on the call for electoral reform to make a voting system that's more representative and the results of of things like this in British Columbia, of course, was the BC Citizens Assembly, um, which recommended single transferable vote, which got 58% in the uh, in the 2005 referendum. Unfortunately, 58% was not deemed high enough by the BC government. So if you come down to a riding level perspective, you can see that what happens in about half the ridings in Canada is that most people don't elect anyone. So here you can see in Kitchener-Waterloo in 2008 that 36.1% voted for the MP that got in and about 64% elected nobody. So to sum up some of the problems with winner-take-all voting, and I'm sure we could do about an hour on this, uh, distorted results as we've talked about, 39% majorities, uh, regional polarization, this is a really big problem. So Stefan Dion once said a bit about our voting system, you know, the day after the election you wake up and find out what part of Canada um, is excluded from the caucus. So that's what we don't want. We want uh, every major national party to be represented in every region uh, in proportion to how much popular support they had in that region. We don't want it to look like everyone in Quebec supports the Bloc or the NDP, everyone in Alberta supports the Conservatives. Um, disregarded votes, safe seats, strategic voting, plugging your nose into voting for somebody that you really don't want to try to stop somebody you can't stand, um, lower voter turnout, and I'll talk about this in a second, a barrier to electing more women and minorities. So we're going to flip over now and look at the other side of the coin. So if we can agree that many of these problems with winner-take-all systems do exist, what is the research showing that proportional representation is going to make a difference? The first thing uh, that a lot of people don't realize is that over 80% of OECD countries use PR systems. So sometimes when you talk to somebody, they'll say it seems like a, a, some kind of radical idea and the only country they've ever heard of that uses this is Italy or something. This is starting to change, but it's taking time. Actually, most of our peers use proportional systems. And proportional systems are uh, used by about 90 countries in the world. So one of the researchers who's done the most work on this is Aaron Leiphart. And he's done pretty much the groundbreaking research that a lot of other researchers have since added to and built, uh, built on. So he looked at 36 countries over two different periods, totaling 55 years. And what he found was that in countries with proportional representation, the voter turnout was 7.5% higher the government policies were closer to the views of the median voter. So what that really means is just uh, governments were consistently making policies that were more in line with what most people wanted. Um, instead of having these uh, flip-flops, policy lurch uh, situations we have in Canada where one of our governments will spend you know, a good part of its mandate just undoing what the last government did and then in four years we could get a return to the policies that we had before. Um, there's more consistency when you have a proportional system. And citizens are more satisfied with their democracy and 8% more women get elected. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now connecting proportional representation to some other issues that people care about. And this is correlational research. So it's important to say that it's not like when we get PR in 2019, um, you know, the next month income inequality in Canada is going to evaporate. It's not going to happen like that. Yeah, but it's, there's a big body of research showing there's strong correlations between um, systems that include people, like proportional systems. And, uh, and policy issues. So, for example, researchers have found that the more proportional the system is, the lower the income inequality is. 
And same with on environment, um, countries with proportional systems consistently score higher on environmental measures. And our guest speaker is going to talk a little bit more about that research. Also, proportional representation tends to elect more women. So again, it's not a guarantee that we're going to elect more women, but it's an extremely high chance. Basically, the reason for that is, in any proportional system, parties need to put forth more than one candidate. So in a winner-take-all system, uh, you know, you get a choice of one candidate from the party that you like on the ballot. And when a party has to run only one candidate, it's really hard for women candidates to break through and win that nomination. Um, it's hard to get past the uh, party gatekeepers and the incumbency advantage. But when a party has to run more than one candidate, for example, with PRSTV, they might run two. As soon as they run two, it looks really bad if they're both men. Um, with an MMP open list system, they'll have a whole list of regional candidates. And if most of their list are men, that also looks really bad. So it provides a natural incentive for parties to put forth more balanced choices for voters. And in a country like Canada, when those choices are available, um, voters tend to elect as many women as they do men. And here we can see that Canada is down at the bottom, along with Australia, United Kingdom, and United States, the last three major countries to use winner-take-all voting systems. So moving on a little bit to the economy, um, one of the fear tactics that we sometimes hear in the media is that if we have proportional representation and the parties have to uh, negotiate and cooperate and there's going to be all this instability and of course that's going to affect the economy you know, because we need a strong stable majority government to decide economic policy. Actually the research shows that countries with proportional systems are less likely to have deficits, more likely to have surpluses and have lower levels of national debt. So again, this decision-making together um, has been proven to work better than single-party false majority decision-making. And this is research that's coming out of places like, uh, like the London School of Economics. So to just go on to the instability theme, um, I'm not hearing this as much these days, but it's still frequent enough uh, that proportional representation means that we're going to have an election every year, basically, because it's unstable and the parties can't get along, so we'll be running to the polls all the time. There's actually no uh, empirical basis for that. So there's been a study done looking at countries over 50 years and showing that the average number of elections in winner-take-all systems and proportional systems is pretty much identical. So what most often happens in a proportional system is that two or more parties will form a majority coalition. So when people say, um, you know, if we don't have first past the post, that's the end of majority governments in Canada. That's not necessarily true. As you can see on this chart looking at 31 OECD countries, and most of the OECD uses PR, uh, most of them have majority governments, but they're majorities that aren't just single party majorities. In terms of public support for proportional representation, there have been polls going back to, uh, I think, the year 2000. So 16 years of polling on this through many different um, governments, through you know sunny days and rainy days and the whole thing. And when you ask people a straightforward question, do you think that a party with 30% of the vote should get about 30% of the seats? Um, Canadians strongly support this idea of fairness. So as recently as February 2016, um, Ecos Polar Frank Graves made exactly this, exactly this statement. And he said that voters place the highest priority on the equality of voter impact. In other words, my vote should count just as much as your vote in terms of deciding um, how the parliament looks. So this consultation the government's doing, um, we need to put it in the context not only of 
50 years of research, but 12 or 13 other Canadian assemblies, commissions, and committees who have all brought together citizens and experts, uh, often MPs, to look at uh, what kind of improvements we should make to our system. And they have all come down on the side of a more proportional system. And this is also the trend around the world. So if we look at what's going on around the world, um, when countries change their voting systems, they rarely move backward toward more majoritarian voting. The trend is, toward, the trend is actually in two directions. One, it's to adding proportionality to electoral systems. And second, within electoral systems, the trend is toward more candidate-centered systems. In other words, not just voting for a party, but being able to choose individual candidates, which all of the PR systems on the table for Canada would already do. So Fair Vote Canada has been running a campaign for the last three years, um, trying to get a commitment from the parties to conduct a process which is actually almost identical to the process we're seeing now, um, to bring parties, experts, and citizens together to design a proportional model and to implement it for 2019. And we are on our way there, thanks to your support. So to look at what the Liberal Party promised before the, uh, the last election, they promised that 2015 would be the last election under first past the post. They repeated that promise in the throne speech and um, they've been very committed to it, which is great. They committed to bringing together an all-party committee to look at reforms such as ranked ballots, PR, mandatory voting, and online voting. So an important thing to note about ranked ballots, and I like to work this in every time um, just because it's really important. Ranked Ranked ballot is not a voting system. So you'll read in all the major media about the ranked ballot system. There's, if you look on an international database, there's no system called the ranked ballot system. Ranked ballots are just a tool. They're a feature. Like, do you want a window in your bedroom or not? Um, they can be used in a winner-take-all system. So you can see on the left of this chart, that alternative vote, such as used in Australia, is a winner-take-all ranked ballot system. And that's what the media is usually referring to when they say ranked ballots. But ranked ballots are just a tool that can also be used in a system proposed by Stéphane Dion. Um, it can be incorporated into a mixed member proportional system. And of course, it's part of PR STV single transferable vote system. So in terms of where the parties are, you can see this vote from December 2014 in the House of Commons when the NDP used its opposition day to put forth a motion for one particular system, which was MMP. And this is how people voted. And you can see that the Conservatives were 100% opposed, the NDP, Bloc and Green, all four. Most of the independents that we had at that time were four. And the Liberal Party was split almost exactly down the middle. And that's when they only had 34 MPs, and now there are 184 of them. But it's pretty safe to say that this is pretty much where the Liberal Party is. There are some opposed, there are some in favor, and there are many, many more who are open-minded and need our help uh, to understand what the options are and why PR is the way to go. And this is what I think most Canadians think. So we have an exciting opportunity ahead. In, in about uh, two weeks, I'm going to do another webinar. And in there, well, I'm going to talk more about how you can get involved. But just to give you a quick overview of where we are in this process. We have an all-party committee that is now proportional to the popular vote, which is um, historic, really historic. The Liberals, as the governing party with a majority of seats, had um, every precedent to make the Electoral Reform Committee uh, the same as every other committee where they would hold a majority, but in response to pressure from the NDP and pressure from grassroots groups, they changed that and now the committee is proportional to the popular vote, which is kind of ironic because this committee that's proportional is going to decide um, if they recommend a voting system which would make our parliament and therefore every committee proportional. 
the government has set down five guiding principles, and I'm not going to go through them all in this webinar, but I'd encourage you to look at the government website and read through them carefully. Uh, but the first one is especially relevant to our issue, because as you can see here, it talks about reducing distortions. So, so you can see um, that the proposed measure would increase public confidence uh, among Canadians that their democratic will as expressed by their votes will be fairly translated and that the proposed measures reduce distortion and strengthen the link between voter intention and the election of representatives. So this is really exciting because only proportional systems um, strengthen that relationship between votes and seats and reduce distortions. So in terms of the timeline for the committee, the committee was formed on June the 7th. The committee began hearing expert witnesses in July, and I'm assuming they're going to continue to hear expert witnesses probably right up through October. They've launched a new website that I'd encourage you to check out. It's full of information on how you can get involved, on voting systems, um, on how you can hold an event. Uh, from July until October, MPs have been invited to hold town halls and the committee will be traveling. So not all MPs are holding town halls. This was an invitation, not a, um, they can't enforce it. So for instance, a lot of the conservative MPs apparently are not going to hold town halls. However, citizens have also been invited to hold their own events and submit their feedback to the committee. And a big job of Fair Vote Canada is to help get information out about the MP town halls and about those events. On December 1st, the committee will release its final report recommending a new voting system, and in May 2017, we'll see the first reading of legislation for a new voting system. So our window of opportunity to impact the MPs by showing up at town halls and participating in this process is small and important. So some ways that you can get involved, if you haven't already, um, we have a website where you can email your MP and ask to be invited to your town hall. And even if your MP has already announced their town hall, or if you know they have no intention of holding a town hall, please do it anyway, because it lets the MPs know that a lot of their constituents support PR and are paying attention to this process. You can follow the committee's work, so you can uh, watch the committee live on CPAC, and they're next on uh, July 25th, and the committee has invited uh, Canadians to tweet in their questions and you can see on my slide what the hashtag is and there'll be more information for Fair Vote Canada coming out about that soon. You can hold your own event and submit your report to the committee and again in the next couple of weeks expect some guidance from Fair Vote about how to do that so we hope lots of people will do that. And important, get involved with other Fair Vote supporters locally. It makes things a lot easier and also makes an impression on your MP. So in the last, uh, last few months, well, last nine months, we've had 500 academics who signed a letter um, calling to implement PR. Uh, 9,000 of you, right after the election, sent a letter to Trudeau and Monsef asking for a process that we can trust. Uh, we visited, you have visited, 140 MPs, um, including well over 100 Liberal MPs in the last four months. We have systems videos. So if you go on the front of fairvote.ca, you, and you click suggested videos, you can see we have two videos on MMP, we have one video on P3, and we have a new video on SDV that is not up on the website yet, but I've included the link here to it. Uh, we have a series on our blog on the front of our site on myth busting, so we've tackled uh, uh, the evidence for all the most common myths that you'll hear, and we have packages that are going to every MP about PR, and we're working on a submission to the parliamentary committee. Okay, so lots to absorb there. So I'm going to invite now um, our special guest, Salman Orlana, to come back on and he talk about his research, which is on proportional representation and good governance. There you are. Okay, I'm just going to change the screen sharing here. Yes, okay. And I'm going to turn off my webcam. Bear with me, everybody. Let me make sure. Okay. Okay, let me see. All right, I think, I think I'm good. Yeah, go for it. Okay. I don't know if it's showing. Is it um, 
Are you able to see the presentation? I don't see your presentation yet. Let's see. Yes, now I see it. You need to make it full screen. Okay. There we go. You able to see everything okay? Yeah, I'm just going to check the question box. So can everybody tell me, um, just tell me yes, if you can see uh, Salman's screen and hear him. I got a yes and a yes. Okay, you're good. Okay. Lots of yeses. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start then. Uh, so I wrote this book, Electoral Systems and Governance, How Diversity Can Improve Policy Making. Um, and I look at, uh, so Anita was looking at the, the fairness of the system. I try to look a little bit more in this book at the, the actual policy consequences of, um, of these different types of electoral systems. And I was basically inspired by reading the classics, so that's why I have this slide here. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I started reading uh, you know, people like Plato and Aristotle, and, and I noticed that they had a lot of concern about what are the best systems of government. Um, and, you know, it, it's actually a pretty uh, normal uh, interest for most people. Uh, most people have something to say about how we can improve our government. So if you, uh, you know, walk around the state of Michigan and talk to, uh, talk to people, especially because we went through an economic depression, uh, we do have a lot of people that have strong opinions about, you know, how we can improve our government, how we can reorganize it in ways that will benefit the public. So we've had past things like term limits, for example, and People here also talk about things like part-time legislature, so letting the legislature only meet for uh, a very short period of time throughout the year. Um, and you know, you can see uh, suggestions about punishing gridlock with, by withholding legislator salaries or things like that. Uh, and some of those reforms, we're already finding out that they don't uh, produce the kind of results that people are hoping for. And I tend to think that a lot of that is because, you know, we we use a lot of passion uh, when we make decisions about uh, what how do how we should organize government. And instead of thinking more rigorously about what actually would produce uh, a better form of government, and so I tried to do that uh, in this book a little bit more, focusing on uh, gathering a lot of data, looking at a lot of past research. Um, and starting with uh, what probably was the main inspiration for me for this book, and that's Karl Popper's idea that uh, if you want to learn as human beings, if you want to advance our knowledge, uh, the best way to do that is to have uh, institutions that protect dissent. So that we have to allow ourselves to have people that question us, or right? we have to have dissenters. And, you know, that's how the scientific process works. Uh, and, and actually, Popper, a lot of his research was focused on the scientific process, that, that we, we need to have other researchers uh, able to question our results and, and try to, you know, actually uh, find some way to bring it down. And if they can't bring it down, then it turns out that the results are actually more accepted. Uh, well, he, he also tried to apply that idea to government. The government should function in a similar way. Uh, and he was arguing that uh, democracies are better than authoritarian governments uh, because they do allow uh, for more dissent and allow for more questioning. Um, and of course, he was writing at a time when there was a lot of people that actually believed that authoritarian governments can outperform democracies, uh, particularly in areas like economic growth. Um, more recently, we have seen some research that looks at how institutions uh, affect all kinds of different areas of, of policy and, uh, and well-being for citizens. So Jaworski and his colleagues actually 
came out with a pretty important book in political science that um, did find that democracies actually do perform better uh, in a variety of, of areas. Uh, when it comes to economics, uh, economic growth, uh, th that's actually a very complicated area where you don't see uh, too many th factors that are actually correlated with economic growth. And here, for example, democracies don't tend to be either. So democracies are not better at producing economic growth than authoritarian governments, but neither are authoritarian governments better than democracies. But we know that democracies are better at producing things like, or at least in terms of indicators like uh, mortality rates, uh, infant mortality, things like that, uh, people in democracies tend to live better lives, at least based on, on those kinds of indicators. Um, we've also seen research on how presidentialism, so whether or not you have a president, uh, can affect things like democratic stability, and we do tend, at least in political science, the general finding has been that democracies with presidents uh, tend to be more unstable. Uh, but for me, the research that seemed uh, most in line with what Popper was talking about was electoral and institutions research. Uh, so uh, electoral institutions researchers have found that um, electoral systems like you know proportional representation uh, versus single member district systems um, they do tend to affect a large or, or many areas of, uh, of political life. Uh, so they, I need to actually touch on some of these things. Um, we do find that, for example, proportional systems do tend to be more responsive to public opinion. Uh, they tend to have higher rates of political participation. Uh, people have more feelings of legitimacy in their government. Um, Corruption uh, is also affected by things like the design of the electoral system, although corruption is actually a little bit of a complex issue that we might be able to talk about a little later. Um, and just all kinds of other areas like uh, redistribution, uh, minority representation, representation of women, um, and environmental performance, and, and I'll actually cover some data on some of these things in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, but specifically, we actually also have some claims that uh, electoral systems can even affect the performance of government in general. So Leipart uh, and Gehring, uh, they, looked, they wrote books that basically tried to make that claim that uh, different kinds of electoral institutions do perform better uh, than others in terms of um, well, in, a, in terms of a wide range of policies. Uh, so, for example, Leipart found that especially multi-party proportional systems uh, do tend to perform better on what he called kinder, gentler policy outcomes. So, environmental performance, redistribution, uh, and things like that. Uh, Gehring found that uh, similar institutions um, also affected things like uh, how the government responded to public opinion, um, human development, uh, and things like that. So, so there's actually also already a lot of research in, uh, on those in those areas on how electoral systems affect uh, performance. I wanted to try to identify the specific mechanisms by which this is happening, because I think that the mechanisms can tell us a lot about you know, why we might want to adopt different kinds of electoral institutions, um, especially because I found that researchers like Leipart and Gehring had really not identified the mechanisms very clearly. So they talked about things like collegiality. So they thought maybe, uh, maybe the difference in performance uh, is based upon the fact that uh, proportional systems tend to have more collegial legislatures, like where people get along a little bit better. Um, well, from my point of view, that uh, that seems a little bit uh, lacking, uh, and so I wanted to add to that, and, and particularly try to identify the concrete mechanisms by which uh, proportional systems do tend to outperform the less proportional systems. Uh, so. I also wanted to apply a, 
a framework that I thought was uh, actually fit quite well with this uh, type of research, and that was the uh, diversity research. Uh, so there's actually a, a large body of, let me see, actually I think this next slide talks about it a little bit. Um, but there's actually a large body of research in uh, on small groups, on the decision making in small groups that looks at the role of diversity. So in general they tend to find that diverse groups uh, do tend to perform well um, and, and actually can outperform less diverse groups in, in a variety of settings. Um, so that's actually um, the main focus of my book is how electoral systems can affect diversity and therefore can affect policy performance. Uh, I tended to think that some of the mechanisms that the small group research uh, identified could be applied to countries as a whole. So the small group research, for example, found that when you have diverse groups, you'll tend to have more dissent, more dissenters. And that can be a, a good thing um, in general because it can you know, help a group from uh, in, engaging in groupthink, for example, or se from settling on a, a specific uh, a, a solution to a problem too soon. Uh, it can deepen deliberation. Uh, and produce more complete solutions. And it can encourage, uh, you know, in innovation and, and new ways of, of trying to solve problems. In, um, of course, another mechanism that uh, diversity might affect is uh, the kind of information that the public gets exposed to. So one thing in political science that we've noticed is that uh, proportional systems do tend to provide uh, probably what could be regarded as better information, um, better political information for, for the average citizen. So uh, proportional systems tend to focus more on uh, specific policy proposals, policy ideas, rather than focusing on you know, the character of candidates or the horse race, like who's actually winning in the polls, for example. So in the United States, a lot of our uh, attention during the campaign season goes to who's winning in the polls and what's the character of this candidate, you know, so Trump versus Hillary, for example. Um, and so Gordon and Segura, in this particular slide, they found that, um, not surprisingly, that citizens in more proportional systems do tend to have better um, or, or score higher on indicators of political knowledge. Um, and that kind of knowledge is actually very beneficial. So Druckmann uh, found that, for example, when you have that access to diverse information, you're less likely to be susceptible to framing effects, where, it, where for example, you might change your mind based upon just how the question is asked. So on a particular issue, you might answer a certain way just based upon how the question is asked. And uh, so you, so that kind of shows that, you know, voters' preferences might be unstable. But in fact, if you actually expose them to diverse forms of information, uh, then they they actually show that they have a more stable preference. Okay, so key questions then are, can this, uh, these, these kind of findings from small group research be applied to uh, countries? Do electoral institutions uh, have that kind of effect on, on, on the political information that, that would uh, you know, affect public opinion and, and policy outcomes? Um, and are those consequences large? Uh, are, are they significant uh, differences across countries? Uh, based upon the, the kind of electoral institution that they might have. Well, we do know there's actually a lot of research on this that uh, countries with uh, more proportional systems, there's there's a variety of mechanisms by which they should affect the kind of information that the public gets exposed to. Uh, so first of all, we do know that 
more proportional systems do tend to have more parties competing in, during the campaign season and during the elections. Um, so that by itself will tend to generate more information. Of course, uh, proportional systems also tend to have more parties winning seats in the legislature. So that also can have an influence on the kind of information that gets produced in the legislature. Um, we also see that uh, more parties in the legislature can also have an influence on the different kind of issues that can be discussed uh, in the legislature. Um, the uh, executives, so committees even, uh, in, in the legislature also will tend to be more diverse. Um, and at least according to Powell, uh, we can even see that uh, in PR systems, maybe because of the collegiality that um, uh, Lightheart and Gehring mentioned, uh, they, they will tend to uh, allow more input from, uh, from opposition parties. So we should expect then that the political discourse will tend to be more diverse in proportional systems as opposed to the plurality uh, systems which, which the British, uh, former British colonies will tend to have. Um, and we'll tend to see that the small parties in particular uh, are the drivers of, of this diversity. So uh, the minor parties, the small parties, can take a lot more risks than the major parties. Uh, so they can introduce ideas that are controversial um, or that the major parties will tend to stick uh, or stay away from. And of course, the SMDP systems, the majoritarian systems, will tend to also push the, the major parties towards the center. Um, although, uh, when you introduce um, relatively successful third parties, uh, that can actually become a little bit more chaotic than that. Okay, I think I... Let's see. So one of the things that I did was uh, I looked at the, the media in New Zealand because I, I anticipated that the, the kind of diversity that you see in the party system, uh, whether it's at the legislative le level or at the, uh, le during the elections, uh, will tend to have an effect on, uh, on what newspapers decide to report on. Um, so. I actually, there's actually been some other research on New Zealand's media, uh, and they do, uh, Hayward and Rudd, for example, did report that um, the, they did notice that before the reforms in New Zealand, because, uh, or maybe I should have mentioned first that New Zealand actually switched from a two-party system to basically a, a multi-party system uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, and before the reforms, they actually had a similar system to what we saw in the United States. So, so their media did tend to pay attention more to the, the character of candidates uh, and less attention to the policy issues that, uh, that the candidates were talking about. So there's more focus on vague statements about politics uh, and less focus on specific ideas. So after the reforms, they noticed that that, that actually changed, uh, that there was more focus on on substantive issues. Uh, I decided to also look at New Zealand's media uh, because I wanted to take a, a more detailed look than, uh, than Hayward and Rudd did. And let me um, first of all point out that the, the, uh, the party system itself did have a pretty sizable effect on first of all who the, who the media decided to cover. So here you can see, let me see if I can put my cursor over it. Um, so a part, particularly a party like the Green, like the Green Party. So they, um, they won 6.8% of the votes in 1990 under the uh, majoritarian system. And they received 1.4% of the mentions uh, in the New Zealand Herald that year. So 6.8% of the vote, 1.4% of the coverage. After the reforms in the proportional system, uh, they received 5.2% of the votes, but they actually 
they actually received 5.8 seats, or basically six seats, um, and they were able to, because they were able to win seats, suddenly the New Zealand Herald gave them a lot more attention. They received almost 16 percent uh, of the mentions, of the party mentions in that, um, in that year. And you can see the same thing with other parties, that basically the ability to win seats is apparently what gives uh, the parties a lot more uh, credibility in the eyes of the media, and therefore they get a lot more attention. And of course that has an effect on things like, you know, what kind of issues actually appear, because the parties will talk about different things. Uh, so. The Green Party, for example, would talk about uh, the environment, and they would bring a lot more attention to the environment. So not surprising then that we see total environmental coverage jump from 10% and 2% in the two elections prior, or in the two majoritarian elections, to 17 and 22% in the two elections after uh, the reforms. In even parties like, well, the Green Party and also uh, there was a legalized cannabis party uh, that started talking about decriminalizing marijuana. And uh, that issue in particular went from practically non-existent to suddenly receiving quite a bit of attention, so uh, a lot of coverage uh, after the reforms. So those are the kinds of things that the minor parties in particular can do. They can bring up some controversial issues uh, that the minor part or the major parties uh, would normally ignore or try to avoid. And uh, you know you can imagine then that that probably has an influence on public opinion. Um, here I, I also tried to look at more specifically uh, the types of ideas that actually appeared in the media. So here uh, I was looking at, I basically snipped like quasi sentences out of the newspaper. Um, you can see in 1990, for example, that on the issue of, or on, uh, uh, on the issue of the environment, um, a lot of the statements that were made, I wonder why my cursor keeps disappearing here, um, but a lot of the statements that were made were re relatively vague pro environment statements, which is actually kind of typical. Uh, because most people in most countries seem to be pro-environment, but it's when when you ask them to talk about specific things that they'd be willing to give up to protect the environment, that's when it gets a little bit more difficult to, to actually talk about the environment. Um, but in 1990, you don't really see very specific proposals uh, on the environment, uh, whereas in 1999, suddenly, especially because of the Green Party success, you see very specific ideas about eco taxes, um, you know, taxing pollution and wasted resources, and, uh, and opposing GMOs and things like that. So suddenly you see specific uh, ideas about the environment, uh, whereas before it was more general uh, statements about uh, protecting the environment. Uh, a similar you can see a similar uh, situation with an issue like law and order, so crime uh, re related to crime. And one of the actually one of the mechanisms that I uh, identify in my book is uh, the mechanism of pandering. That uh, especially on security issues like crime, uh, the two party systems will tend to produce a dynamic that's relatively aggressive, so relatively punitive. Um, once one party starts to talk about, you know, taking a hard line on crime, uh, then the other party will either do the same thing or actually try to avoid that topic. And actually today you see it probably more clearly on the issue of guns in, in the United States. So um, the Democratic Party was punished uh, in the elections because they they did try to do something about guns in the, in the 1990s, and ever since then, basically, they, they haven't, uh, whenever a gun issue comes up, 
they usually try to avoid it uh, or to avoid talking about regulating guns, for example. Um, well, that's actually the same kind of thing we see in, in the, on an issue like crime. Um, we do see that, in general, the positions that uh, are taken are more aggressive and uh, more focused on punishment, trying to solve crime by, by just punishing more people. Whereas in the, under the, oops, under the uh, MMP system, under the proportional system in 1999, you can see there's a lot more ideas offered about it, and there's actually a lot more focus on things like prevention, uh, the Green Party talking about restorative justice and spending more on mental health and things like that. So in general, suddenly you see more what I would consider to be more dissenting views on uh, on an issue like crime, and and then you could even consider them more long-term views, more long-term solutions uh, to uh, to solving crime. Whereas in in the 1990 election, uh, it's more punitive, more short-term focused, and that's why I, I refer to this issue as uh, as a good example of of pandering. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some data here. Um, so here we're looking at uh, how the the number of parties uh, affects uh, public opinion on on the environment. So uh, I'm looking at um, on the horizontal axis here legislative fractional fractionalization, which is just a fancy way of measuring uh, the number of parties in a in a system. So 0.5 would basically be equal to a two-party system, uh, whereas 0.8 would be the more diverse party systems over here, uh, including mostly Scandinavian countries. Um, and a a as I mentioned earlier, because you do have, you know, when, when you do have more parties, that means you're going to have more green parties or ecological parties, and they're going to talk about you know specific ideas about protecting the environment uh, and you know making voters aware of the costs that are involved uh, with protecting the environment so there you know there are some costs like eco taxes that you might have to uh, think about well here this the question that uh, I used was came from the world value survey and the question asked um, whether or not uh, the government should reduce environmental pollution but it should not cost me any money. So it's kind of an indirect way of trying to get people to uh, show their actual level of support for the government or, or for, for the protecting the environment. Um, because in general, most people, as I mentioned, do tend to be pro-environment or supportive of protecting the environment, but it's when you, they actually become aware of the costs that suddenly the support tends to drop. And so that, that's why this question actually gets used, um, particularly by people like Engelhardt, to measure um, oops, uh, support for uh, public support for, for environmental protection. But in general, you can see here that there is a you could draw a trend line uh, towards uh, in a positive direction here. So that um, the more parties you have, the more support you tend to see. Uh, on protecting the environment. And here I, I look at um, how that might actually affect specific policy outcomes like taxing gasoline. Um, so in the United States you can see that dynamic very clearly uh, during the elections. Um, when prices of gas go up for example, uh, you can immediately count on one party to be attacking the other uh, on uh, on the fact that gas prices are too high. Uh, so that's hurting voters. And so, you know, from my view, it's a, if we know if we take uh, into account something like climate change, then if you're just trying to promote uh, low gasoline prices for you know short-term uh, comfort of voters, then I, I tend to perceive that as pandering. Um, and you can see here that countries with fewer parties do tend to have lower taxes on gasoline prices. So 
less willingness uh, to, uh, you know, to pay the cost of protecting the environment or to responding to something like climate change, whereas countries with more parties will tend to have uh, higher levels of support or higher levels of taxation on gasoline. Okay, so, and then coming back to an issue like um, incarceration. Um, if, if the parties will tend to be more aggressive on uh, promoting, you know, tougher uh, policies on, on dealing with crime, then it should not be a surprise if we see that uh, countries with fewer parties tend to be, tend to have higher incarceration rates, that they will tend to punish more people, lock up more people. And, and in fact, there's a pretty strong uh, correlation there. You can see that um, countries with fewer parties do tend to have much higher incarceration rates uh, than countries with more parties. And of course, the, U the United States is a massive outlier, um, probably because we do have a pretty pure two-party system where uh, it's very difficult to find dissenters on uh, it, you know, proposing alternatives to just punishment. Um, but on top of that, we also have, you know, racial tensions that, uh, that might not exist in other countries as, as strongly. Um, but even if you remove the United States, you, do, you would still see a pretty strong correlation here uh, that the more parties you have, the, more, uh, the lower the incarcerations will tend to be. And probably uh, the more focus there would be on prevention uh, rather than uh, just punishment. Okay, so one other issue that I wanted to mention here, I could go on and on. Um, there's, I actually covered a lot of data, uh, but let me just bring up one more uh, topic here, and then uh, you can always leave things for, for another time, hopefully. Uh, but what, one uh, issue area that a lot of people tend to be concerned about with proportional systems is that it does give voice, you know, so diversity does mean that you're going to give more voice to extreme elements like, uh, you know, far-right parties, for example. Um, so you should expect to see uh, that they'll get their message out about, you know, something like immigration. They, they might be, uh, you know, trying to win votes by getting voters scared of, of immigrants. Uh, and so if, if they are out there uh, spreading their message about immigration, then shouldn't we see that proportional systems then might tend to be more uh, intolerant of, of immigrants and, and maybe intolerant of minorities in general? Um, well, I did look at that issue uh, in two ways. Here, I'm, I'm only going to present one way, but just and I found basically the same result for both. But, um, but here, just looking particularly at immigration, we do see that uh, there's no trend line here. Uh, you really can't draw a trend line anywhere. So there is no correlation uh, that you could claim to, uh, claim to observe. And I've also analyzed this statistically, and, and you really can't um, uh, find a, uh, a correlation there at all. So. Countries with more parties uh, will tend to, they're not going to be more tolerant of immigrants, uh, but neither are countries with fewer parties. Uh, so there's, there's pretty much no trend line there. Um, it's probably affected by other things more uh, profoundly than, than things like the electoral system. So of course that also brings up a very interesting point that uh, you know, you do have these far-right parties that exist in the proportional systems, but they do get their certain level of support, but they don't seem to have a, a, a huge effect on the rest of the population. Uh, the, the rest of the population seems to be more affected by things like, you know, protecting the environment, um, dealing with crime in a, in a more sophisticated, long-term way, um, and but they, they don't seem to be as affected by these messages that are being promoted by the far right. And, and I'm not the only one that's looked at this. I, I do have a couple of other colleagues that have looked at this and found a similar thing. Um, okay, so 
in general, uh, I just would point out that you know more diverse systems do seem to allow countries to solve certain problems uh, more efficiently. So uh, I would make the claim that proportional systems do allow countries to learn faster. Societies learn a little bit faster on certain areas. So take an issue like same-sex marriage. Um, the proportional countries with proportional systems were the first to act on that issue, uh, and you know they allowed for civil union legislation uh, a couple decades ago. Some of the earlier ones, um, and in fact, if you think about the United States and Canada, they it's very possible that if the courts hadn't acted, uh, the legislature probably still would not have acted um, until maybe sometime around this year. So. It can take uh, a few decades longer for uh, majorita majoritarian systems to do something that proportional systems uh, were able to do much earlier. Uh, of course, I, I brought up the issue of pandering. I do think that uh, uh, proportional systems allow countries to deal with an issue like pandering more, uh, more effectively, particularly because they do tend to have more dissent. Um, of course, you know, as human beings, we are um, we still have problems to face, and some of these issues uh, might actually be affected by the electoral systems. So, if you think about something like euthanasia, um, it's a controversial topic. That's probably one that will be more uh, addressed earlier on by proportional systems. Something like uh, if you know, there's the, there has been growing concern, particularly in the media and, and among social scientists, that you know, if machines could replace human labor, you know, what is policy going to do? Uh, which countries might act first on something like that? I might predict that uh, proportional systems would. Um, I do want to leave you with one last uh, one last idea here, though, and that's you know, diversity or diverse systems like proportional representation, uh, they're not going to be a panacea. They, as human beings, we do have uh, our cognitive limitations, no matter how well we organize ourselves. But on the other hand, um, you know, when you look at the data, you do see that uh, proportional systems do allow countries to make significantly, uh, or, or do produce significantly better outcomes uh, overall. So. Um, I do have some friends in proportional systems who, you know, they'll, they'll remind me that, you know, proportional systems are not perfect. They are, um, they do still have their problems. But uh, I always also remind them that, you know, when you look at the data, you do see that they don't have, their problems are not, maybe not as big as, as the ones that you do tend to find in the SMDP systems or majoritarian systems. So I'll leave it at that uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Okay. Give me a sec here. I'm just putting my webcam back on. All right. Okay, super. Thank you so much, Salman. And I would encourage um, people to take a look for, out for his book because the data that he touched on connecting PR to policy issues, there's actually a lot more of it in his book. Um, and I've written a little summary of his book, and if you want it, just email me. Okay, um, so I'm going to look at the questions now. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start for, with one that I think is for me here. And okay, first of all, can everybody see and hear me? Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so this person said, is first past the post off the table? If not, why not? Um, I would say effectively, if the government keeps its promise, yes, it's off the table. Three parties campaigned in the last election that this would be the last first past the post election. So um, the government's committed to keeping that promise. So I would say that first past the post uh, is off the table in the mind of the government, uh, even if not every opposition party agrees with that. So now let me just see. Where did my questions go? Um, 
And yes, we will send you our uh, Salman's PowerPoint presentation. Okay, this is a good question. Does more disagreement lead to taking longer to implement change? Um, I guess it could in, uh, in countries where you tend to have, uh, you know, more checks and balances where you might have, you know, two chambers and a president, uh, you could have, you know, what, what we tend to see in the United States, which is gridlock, but that's not necessarily something that's associated with, you know, proportional representation. That might be uh, something that's more associated with uh, having two chambers and a president. Uh, so having more veto players involved in the policymaking process. So we're definitely seeing that in the United States, but that's, you know, we are a two-party system. Uh, so I think that kind of delay is more affected by the number of veto players in the system. Uh, whereas, you know, the diversity that I'm talking about uh, in general probably produces more early action on, depending on the issue, but, you know, like I mentioned with something like uh, same-sex rights, action was taken much earlier uh, on, that, on that issue in proportional systems uh, than it is under uh, the majoritarian systems. Just to add to that, um, some of the other research that's in his book uh, talks about the increase in carbon emissions. And so, you know, after many of the countries signed the Kyoto Protocol, which proportional countries were the first ones, they were quicker to sign on to it, we see that while none of the overall the carbon emissions continue to increase. So it really, it wasn't a humongous success, but proportional countries were able to keep their, the increase of their emissions under much better control than the majoritarian countries. So I, I think it's a little bit of a myth that proportional countries are going to take longer to make decisions because actually we see in a lot of areas that they're uh, working together is actually producing progress faster than yeah. the the single party majority governments who should be able to do whatever they want but sometimes in a majoritarian system they lack the courage to do it so yeah yes yes even, exactly even if, uh, on an issue like climate change uh, you do see um, you know you, you can see even just stories but you can also see it clearly in the data but uh, if you if you look at the media stories on what Germany is doing with solar power or um, what uh, Sweden or Norway are doing with alternative energy, uh, you can see that those countries actually move much faster uh, on those kind of issues than, than we do. Okay, and so I have another question. Has anyone done any work correlating voting systems to government debt, employment, and income inequality? Uh, I, well, I did look at government debt, um, and so it's a little bit of a complex issue because it kind of depends on how you measure the electoral systems. Um, because some researchers uh, make the claim that uh, proportional systems might tend to get more in trouble with that. Uh, but it's because if you measure it based upon, you know, just whether you have PR or whether you have the majoritarian system, just only have two categories, uh, then you basically lump a lot of countries that, that have problems with that into the PR category. So countries like Greece uh, and Chile, well actually Chile is usually pretty good with, with that, but, uh, but Greece in, in particular or Japan, um, they actually have proportional systems, but they're very restricted proportional systems that tend to produce two-party systems. Uh, and so if you, I generally would categorize categorize those countries as more majoritarian because they do have uh, limits in place or restrictions that, that actually limit diversity. Um, and so in my research I actually tend to find that those countries uh, actually make uh, majoritarian uh, systems look a little bit like they have more trouble with that. Um, so I guess this, the the findings, I guess, at this point, I would say, are, are conflicting. Although I do think that uh, it, it's it sort of depends on how you measure things. 
Well, yeah, exactly. I think what Salman's saying is that there, there are always outliers that can really skew data. So it's like if you lump the United States and their incarceration rates in with majoritarian systems, I mean, we can see that majoritarian systems have higher levels of incarceration and more punitive approaches to crime. But if you include the United States data in that, it's going to make them look a lot worse than they actually are. So it depends on what country you put where. So for those of you who don't know about Greece, Greece does not have, and contrary to what the media likes to say all the time, um, Greece does not have a proportional system. They have a system where it starts out proportionally, and then whatever party gets the most seats, so whoever's the plurality winner gets 50 bonus seats just, just for being so special. And the goal of that is to produce a phony majority government. So then when you look at Greece's debt problem and you say, okay, do we put that into the proportional category or the majoritarian category and should we put them anywhere at all because obviously they're kind of an outlier. So that's why he's saying that it's complicated. But I think the general finding when I looked at, um, I mean, I'd have to look again at Salomon's book, is that he generally found that the levels of national debt were lower in proportional countries. So Yes. Yes, and in large part it's because it, it, it appears that proportional countries do tend to have an easier time uh, raising revenue. Uh, so in countries like the United States, it's very difficult to talk about something like taxes, uh, and so it becomes very difficult to raise the revenues that you need to pay for government, and so it's not surprising uh, that you do tend to see so, so I, I would say that the pandering dynamic gets involved there, you know, where politicians make promises about, you know, we're going to cut your taxes, but then at the same time they have a difficult time saying what they're going to cut. Uh, and so you do see, uh, you know, higher budget deficits in countries with fewer parties, uh, and you do tend to see more uh, national debt in the long run. Um, so I, I, I I generally tend to like my results, but <laughs> but, but there are some people that have uh, produced different results. So. so I think this goes back to um, this idea of being able to deal with long-term, serious long-term issues. So when we look at our taxation system, you know, when we look at income inequality, when we look at climate change, those are all issues where, in a majoritarian system, politicians are the the big parties are very risk averse and more likely to to pander, you know, we'll cut your taxes, but we won't cut any of your services, but we're not really sure where we're going to cut the taxes, but we want to do these things, but we don't have the money. Um, in proportional countries, what his research showed is that the public is more accepting of long-term solutions to taxation, to income inequality, to crime. They're more willing to um, kick in and share the costs to make that happen. Uh, so it's not, they don't have to worry, you know, they're going to lose a few votes and a few swing ridings and that's going to cost them the whole election if they say the wrong thing. Because the smaller parties and the diverse voices can bring those ideas out in the media that uh, just don't tend to get much airplay uh, in the winner-take-all countries. This here is a question, um, has when you calculated legislative fractionalization, how did you define a party, for example, having a seat in the legislature? This is actually something I want to touch on a little bit first before Solomon answers, because when you see the word legislative fractionalization, it seems tends to scare people, like a fragmentation, like, oh, we're going to have this fragmented party system. They're just talking about the number of effective parties, parties that have really any power in the legislature. And if you look at um, Germany and... I, just look at Germany and Ireland, for example. They were showing all those good results on, on um, Salman's chart, but Germany has four effective parties. Um, New Zealand has, I'm not sure the number of effective parties now, but they have eight parties in their legislature. Ireland, which is a proportional system, has seven parties. Um, and Canada, in our last parliament, we had six parties and independents. So they're not, it's not wildly different um, from what we we see now, so can you can you explain how you define that? Sure. Well, legislative fractionalization is actually, uh, I guess, the accepted way of measuring party systems in political science right now. Um, it used to be the, the effective number of parties, um, and then 
I don't know uh, exactly why they decided to change it because they're basically correlated very, very strongly. So the effective number of parties is very correlated with legislative fractionalization, but uh, there's a lot more data available in legislative fractionalization, so that's why I tend to use that myself. But, uh, but it's just basically the uh, the probability that if you select two members out of the legislature, they're going to be from different parties. Um, and so, you know, they use a math equation uh, to, to figure that out, but it's, um, it's basically strongly correlated with other measurements uh, of the, like the effective number of parties. Uh, it's just, I mean, you, you, all, you practically see a straight line <laughs> when you run a correlation on that. So, so it's probably, you can think of it uh, as just the effective number of parties. Um, does a proportional system lead to more extreme parties being represented in the legislature? And if so, how does that affect the tone of political discourse? Could you repeat that one? Yeah. Okay. Does a PR system lead to more extreme parties being represented in the legislature? And if so, how does that affect the tone of political discourse? I think they're talking about the I don't know how much they, they yell at each other and how adversarial it is, perhaps? Sure, sure. Um, it really kind of depends on uh, what other uh, institutions or, or uh, restrictions uh, the, the country puts in place. So if you have a proportional system um, and, and you if it's purely proportional, then you probably end up with something like 20 parties or something. Um, but most countries have some kind of limitation, like they'll have a legal threshold that a party needs to cross in order to win uh, any kind of seats. Uh, so if you think about Germany, that's probably the best example that most people will, will think about. They have a 5% requirement that if a party cannot get over 5% of the vote, uh, then they don't win any seats at all. And um, that basically produced a three-party system for, for several decades. Uh, and then um, now the party system has become a little bit more fragmented, but it's basically up to around six parties. Uh, so those kind of uh, extra uh, restrictions, you know, I think I would generally support something like that. Uh, maybe like a 4% uh, threshold, which is what you see in, in a country like Sweden. Um, and, you know, you do tend to see a, a m much uh, more moderate fragmentation of the party system, uh, about five to seven parties. And you don't really see, um, you know, the, the kind of divisions that you see, like, for example, in the United States. So our two-party system here is extremely pol polarized. The parties can't get along at all. Uh, and I, I would be hard pressed to find, uh, to think of an example in a proportional system where you have parties that are this discordant. Um, so could you have, yes, you probably will have some, uh, you know, extreme right wing parties, but, you know, to some extent, you, you, you probably are seeing that in the majoritarian systems as well. Um, I mean, you, well, I don't want to get too political, but uh, you, you do see, uh, I think, uh, a lot of similar anti-immigrant elements, for example, in the United States. Uh, so I don't know that it makes us immune from those kind of messages um, just to have a two-party system. I wanted and to comment a bit on that, too, in terms of the, um, the systems that are on the table for Canada. So. A lot of people don't really realize that the degree of proportionality um, that you see in many of the European countries, the mixed member proportional models uh, with regional seats, the single transferable vote models with say a five seat district in an urban area, uh, the thresholds are quite a bit higher <laughs> to get elected than in many of the proportional models out there. So, you know, the most generous models are going to already put a cap that's a fair bit higher just by the design of them 
um, than we see in many of the proportional countries. So I don't think it's too likely that we're going to see an explosion of parties in Canada if you, when you have a model that you need 7 or 10 or more percent in a region or a local district to win a seat. So if you look at the Green Party, they uh, got 3.8 percent of the vote in the last election. Um, the highest they've got is 6.8. Um, and it took them 20 years to get to that. Our, we have about 15 to 20 fringe parties in Canada, and between them, they can't get 1% of the vote. Between them, like when you add them all together. So there's not, I don't see a big risk of a lot more parties developing in Canada and winning seats. Those, those barriers are already built in because of our desire to keep um, an important element of local representation. And I also want to comment on the research too, that I've read other research that's shown that even when there are more extreme parties in a proportional system that are getting their message out there, the public isn't more any more likely to support those parties or those messages. Just hearing them, those messages, isn't a danger. Do you want to? Yeah. Yes. Well, and that's actually something I, I looked at in the book. Uh, and that I have a couple of colleagues that have also looked at that, and we don't tend to see, um, you know, more those extreme messages affecting the broader public. So, so they are uh, loud, and they do get attention, but um, you don't see public opinion going in, in their direction. Um, so, you know, the, you don't see proportional systems being more anti-immigrant or anti-minority or, or anything like that. Um, on the contrary, I, I guess from my point of view, because of the pandering dynamics, you might actually tend to see it more often in, in majoritarian systems because, um, well, it, it sort of depends on the context, but you know, in, in, in the U.S. South, for example, it was, uh, it was acceptable at one point to, to pander on you know, on race, uh, and that's how a lot of politicians would get elected. And so it, it sort of depends on the context, um, but you know, the the electoral system is not necessarily going to uh, limit those messages. Uh, and as I mentioned, even if those messages get out, at least in the proportional systems, you don't see see them having a big effect or any effect really. Okay, somebody's asking, um, Matt is asking, um, and this won't mean much to those who haven't looked at the book, but it's a really good opportunity to bring in this new concept, which I think is really important. He says, can you expand on your argument in the book that PR systems tend to reduce elite extraction? So can you tell us what elite extraction means and how it relates to proportional representation? Uh, okay, so that's a term that I took from... Um, Oof, his name escapes me at the, at the moment, but a couple of economists uh, were talking about how the um, uh, uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, those were the, the two economists, but they were talking about how um, elite extraction prevents societies from developing. Uh, so, you know, why they were looking particularly at why are some countries rich and why are some countries poor, and they, uh, they made the argument that uh, in, in the in countries that remain poor, it's because their elites uh, extract the wealth from the society for themselves uh, at the cost to the general public or to the to their basically to the whole society. Um, and from my point of view, I, I was looking at it uh, in in you know modern societies or, or developed societies. Uh, I still think that there is. I mean. And I think most people would probably agree that there is some level of elite extraction that's still taking place, and that it, it, it's costly to society. Um, so elites are constantly looking for some way to make themselves rich at the expense of the rest of us, uh, and that's that's I think that's pretty normal in most societies. Um, so we have to find some way to con you know constrain or contain that. Uh, uh, that development or that uh, that possibility, and I've seen some relationships uh, between electoral institutions and uh, certain outcomes, like on obesity, for example. So that's one of the ones that I looked at. So why 
do we have, why is it that, you know, proportional or proportionality of an electoral system is correlated with obesity? Uh, so that's kind of an odd thing uh, to, to see that, you know, the electoral system might even explain uh, obesity. Uh, well, I make the claim that it's because proportional systems uh, have this uh, a higher capacity to be able to stand up to uh, extractive elites like the food industry. So if you look at the food industry in the United States, for example, they, they want to keep their ability to advertise to, to children, you know, junk food uh, or whatever, uh, or they want to keep their ability to to sell high sugar products to uh, to children or, or whoever. And w whenever you a government official tries to propose an idea to you know to regulate that or to limit the, that kind of behavior, um, the food industry usually tends to be more successful in the United States than uh, than it would be maybe in in a more proportional system. So you look at Sweden and Norway, for example, and they've taken some actions on banning uh, advertising to children. Uh, well, in the United States, it's uh, it's probably going to be a while before we take that kind of action, before we ban advertising to children. Even though, you know, it could save society a lot of money in the long run because of, of course, and it'll save, you know, people's health for, um, you know, children won't have to uh, worry about getting as, as obese later on. But but it's, it's something that um, you see proportional systems more able to act on than the majoritarian systems. And so uh, I also try to look at it uh, in terms of inequality, because um, I, th I think that inequality to a large extent is also driven by, um, uh, by, the, po by the power differences between uh, the elites or the top uh, of the income distribution uh, versus lower income uh, or, or the rest of the society, and we do tend to see that, you know, inequality is is considerably higher in majoritarian systems than in uh, in the proportional system. So I think that's also an indicator of elite extraction, although it's a, it's a more general and broader uh, indicator because there's also other, some other factors that contribute to, to inequality. But uh, but something like um, even um, what, another issue that I looked at in the book was. Um, renewable uh, technologies, uh, so implementation of renewable technologies. So now we know, you know, pretty pretty well that climate change is happening and that uh, we we need to respond by reducing fossil fuel uh, emissions. And uh, of course, the fossil fuel industry wants to prevent adoption of renewable technology. So, which countries are going to be the first to adopt it uh, or to implement it widely? And we do tend to see that the proportional systems are, are the ones that are actually doing that. Um, and why why are they doing that? Well, in a state like Michigan, for example, you do see that uh, the fossil fuel industry does seem to have some influence here because we, uh, we're we doing everything we can to make sure that uh, it's not profitable for people to, for example, put solar panels on their, on their houses. Um, and so they're trying to pass legislation here that that makes that less profitable uh, and makes it more difficult. So um, I think that those are the kinds of policies that I'm I'm talking about when I when I look at elite extraction. So. I think also it's um, you know if, if you look at the the why why is it harder for the elites to um, control policy in proportional systems. Sometimes it has to do with the fact that a coalition government is made up of two or three parties. So if an industry has a specific set of regulations they'd like passed to, um, the, to further their own ends, in a single party majority system, they have to convince you know, a small group within one party to agree with them. In a proportional system, they have to convince two or three parties. <laughs> Who are in a coalition to agree with them? So it's it's it's. I think it would be harder to find an in, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, and that's exactly exactly what I mentioned in the book. That it is it's probably harder for for the elites to capture the party system when you have more parties, or you know, if the whole system is captured, it's also easier to create a new party uh, that can challenge the uh, the party system. So. 
you can imagine yeah some of those mechanisms in place in, in proportional systems that it, it is easier to to challenge uh, extractive elites in in proportional systems okay. um, I'm getting a question here it's a little bit complicated but uh, I think probably just because of the media, it's maybe a little, you could address this. Somebody's asking about Spain. So Spain has um, has a, I mean, we hear that it's a proportional system. However, they have a 6% bonus uh, for the largest party, kind of like Greece, right? You win the most cookies and we give you more kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How, where would you classify Spain in terms of electoral systems? Oh, it's a tricky one because they they have um, differing sizes for their electoral districts uh, as well. So, in some areas uh, of the country, they're relatively majoritarian, uh, whereas in other areas, they're they're actually pretty proportional. Um, particularly, uh, like in Catalonia and in the Barcelona area, they that they have one big district there where it's it's easier for minor parties to win seats in, in that district in particular, but the rest of the country actually has smaller districts, so so it makes for a very odd mix uh, of things, um, and, and, and it does make it tough to categorize it, but I think for the most part I tend to lump it in with uh, the proportional systems because it is um, uh, mostly because of you know the the kind of measures it, it it produces on the effective threshold or the uh, uh, legislative fractionalization index. So, um, but yeah, it's a tricky one because it is uh, probably more majoritarian throughout most of the country, but there's parts of it where it's actually very proportional. So, <laughs> so that. Um, but you know, at least in my analysis and my statistical analysis, I, I think it tended to fall more on the proportional side. Okay, so I have one more question. It's kind of I'm not sure it's really a question that anybody can answer definitively. It's more this person's making a reflection, saying that a lot of the opponents of proportional representation um, will say basically if if we had had proportional representation back fill in the government, fill in the year, we never would have been able to pass fill in the policy because, you know, when there's more diversity, then uh, we wouldn't have been able to get things done. So he wants to know why do politicians say this? Is it a psychological error or a psychological one? Uh, well, I guess in general, politicians are probably... Um, they probably haven't thought too much too much about it, especially people who have opposed who are opponents of the system. Uh, but also, you know, if if you're functioning under a system where you're doing well, uh, you're probably going to continue to support that system. Um, you know, if you if you keep getting elected, then there must be something right with with the system. Um, so you know, they they'll probably say things um, to um, especially if they if they if they have some sense of insecurity that goes along with that, they'll probably uh, say whatever just to um, uh, you know to to, to 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 drag down the uh, the reforms or the possibility of reforms. Okay. So I just also wanted to touch on one point, and then I, I'm going to thank everybody and say. Uh, say goodbye. Um, so I just wanted to mention too around the idea of multi-party systems. There's a lot of research out there showing now that proportional representation doesn't actually create multi-party systems. That multi-party systems existed before and what makes a country more likely to move to a proportional system is when you see that diversity. Like we're seeing around the world, whether it's winner take all or proportional, we're seeing more and more diversity in political parties, in uh, voters being less attached to the big traditional parties. So um, there's some interesting research showing that when a country hits a certain number of effective parties, the odds that they will transition to PR actually increase. And Canada's like right at that that line. So we're right at the right point. I mean, we sh maybe could have done this 20 years ago, but we're at the right point 
to adapt our voting system to our diverse country. Um, so there's a bunch more questions people have asked about specific proportional systems, about MMP, STV, about how a hybrid of the two could work. And I want to say to you that we do want to answer those. And I'm going to be having a webinar in about two weeks on that specifically. It's going to be PR um, 101, but not like I did today, PR 101 looking at the basics of the options on the table for Canada and what values those systems fulfill. So uh, you'll be getting a notice about that once I get sure. that whole thing organized. But in the meantime, if you have specific systems questions, please feel free to email me. So I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us today and, um, and stayed on on this, well, it's a beautiful day for me here in Ontario. And I encourage you to support Fair Vote Canada. Um, we exist only with donations, small donations by individuals that allowed us to do this. It was your support, your donations that allowed us to purchase this GoToWebinar program so that we can run these webinars uh, all the time. I am trying to record it. I've pressed the record button and we'll see what happens. Um, if it works out, then I'm going to send it out to everybody who registered for this and we'll also put it up on our YouTube channel. So and uh, so and there'll also be a summary the slides. I can send the slides to everybody and that'll include the information about Salman's book if you want to go and learn more. So again thank you for to everybody for joining us and for your support. A fair vote. Bye. Oh thanks for having me. Thanks so much.